والتسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his noble family, righteous companions, and all those that follow them with right guidance until the day of judgment. Ameen. Glory be to you, Allah. No knowledge have we except that which you have taught us. Indeed, you are the all-knowing, the all-wise. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this event. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us. You could be a million different places on a Sunday at this time when the weather is fairly nice. You could be at Dr. Cafe with your friends or your family, and maybe you are. But you're not here just to have coffee. You're not here just to feed your body. You're also here to feed your mind and your soul. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your families and bless your time. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering and accept it from us. And this is indeed uh, something which a Muslim rejoices about when he sees Muslims coming back to the religion, thirsty for knowledge, for increasing their faith, knowing that this dunya is just, it's a passing phase. It's just a very temporary time where people are passing, you're in transit, okay, and I'm, I assume most people have traveled, and sometimes it's difficult to think about it this way, because as short as it is, in our minds, in the way we perceive things, it seems so long, but when we do see Al-Akhirah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the winners in Al-Akhirah, then we will be like, oh my God, it was a transit point. It was an instant. So uh, the people of Jannah will be saying, oh yeah, there was, remember that time, that instant in time when we were in the dunya? You're going to forget it completely. Like so many things in our lives where it was a, a, a passing instant, it was so fast, and you actually forgot about it completely. And you only remembered it because you saw an email nine years ago, and you're like, oh... I forgot that even happened. It's hard to imagine that that's what the dunya will be, but it is. When, when we are in Al-Akhirah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise our status, inshallah, and protect us from hellfire. With that said, I also salute the organizers for finding this place. I've been to this doctor cafe and never knew there was such a nice place uh, above. So alhamdulillah, uh, our brothers and sisters are, are seeking out, you know, the, the places and the venues and the loopholes and, you know, what you can do, trying to find out every capacity. As this is, and the atmosphere is a little bit more informal, I'll try to keep the lecture maybe a little bit shorter and try to open it up, especially as I believe this topic may be somewhat controversial and people have questions and it's nice to go back and forth instead of just me uh, speaking for two hours. So I think we'll, we'll, I'll speak for about maybe an hour or so, give you a small break and then we can open it for Q&A, inshallah. When the brothers asked me to talk about this topic, I hesitated. And that hesitation manifested in self, itself in my delay in responding to the uh, invitation. I was accepting the invitation in general, but I was hesitant about the topic. Because the topic is not easy, number one. Number two, because subhanAllah and the will and taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a question I was asking myself as well because of personal circumstances that I am experiencing. And it's, uh, and thinking about it and trying to understand the issue. And then the, the brothers figured, hesitate or not, we're going to give him the topic and they sent me the flyer and it was too late. And I figured, Qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al, I might as well do it 
will be beneficial for myself as well as those listening, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease everyone's affairs, inshallah. I will not spend too much time discussing some of the obvious. Some of the obvious is the fact that this dunya is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think everyone knows this. At the same time, and on the other hand, people know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what He pleases. He rewards whom He pleases and He punishes whom He pleases. Even though there are reasons for that, as we know. So there is a reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarding and there is a reason for punishing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. Albeit we don't always understand the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His actions. And this is very important. This is one of the main reasons a lot of people go astray. is because they try to explain and understand everything Allah Azza wa Jal does with a mind that is like a small speck of dust in this universe. As great as your mental capacity may be, as amazing as our brain power is, are you comparing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can our feeble minds understand all of the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the seminal verse in the Noble Quran, Ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, la yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun. He is not asked about what he does, and they are asked about what they do. So this is one of the foundations that we need to lay before we start getting into the rest of the details. Whatever Allah Azza wa Jal does, we can attempt to understand. And indeed, Allah in the Quran explains to us many times His actions, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may do things. But that is in general. But then when we try to come and understand it, in the relevant details in our lives or in the lives of people we know or in the lives of the ummah at large becomes more difficult. Allah gave you the foundations. But to answer you and say, why did Allah do this on this specific date at this specific time? We come back to this foundation. لا يسأل عما يفعل Allah is not asked. You may search for the wisdom and you'll find it if you search long enough. Know very well that however difficult it may be at times to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does or decrees. This is not a question that should be always on a Muslim's mind. And I'll get to that inshaAllah. We know that this life is a test from Allah azza wa jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Mulk that He created death and life in order to test us who is best in deed, who is best in action. So it's all ibtila, it's all a test. And by the way, this subject, this idea, really is an earth-shattering idea. And as simple as it seems for Muslims who live their lives according to this principle that this life is a test when you try to explain this to a non-muslim or a muslim is newly guided it is truly revolutionary it's revel it's no less than revolutionary believe me now they may find it difficult to understand some muslims take it for granted ah oh, your first answer is life is a test yes life is a test that's not a simple issue it's actually the answer to many of your questions it's the answer to many of the issues that confounded even scholars. If you look at it very deeply, a firm foundation in the manifestations of the fact that this life is a test practically solves many of those problems, those mental issues. It's a test. The problem is a lot of the questions we're asking seem to insinuate that uh, this life is all it's about. It's not only about this life. 
Once you put the afterlife into the equation, so you're trying to solve an equation for mathematicians, engineers, and so on. You're trying to solve an equation and you don't have the key variable. You're dealing with the other variables. Bring the, the last variable, al-akhirah. Put it into the equation. It's solved. You're just focusing on the dunya. That's the problem. You're just trying to understand things in the context of the dunya. And this dunya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worth what? The wing of a mosquito? Is it worth the wing of a mosquito in the sight of Allah? Dunya equals wing of a mosquito. True or false? True. True? False. It's not worth the wing of a mosquito. It's less. That's why the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, if the dunya, لو كانت الدنيا تعدل جناح بعوضا ما سقى كافرا منها شربة ماء If it was equal to the wing of a mosquito, Allah would not have given a disbeliever even a drink, something to drink. But because it's not equal to, if it was equal to, he would not deserve even that because of their disbelief and the gravity of this sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because it's not worth that, so He gives them and gives them. Let them have whatever they want. This is in the dunya. So it's not equal to. So when you put all of that in context and then you start asking questions like, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to so and so? Why did this earthquake occur in this country or that? This natural disaster or that? Well, I mean, this is something so minuscule and trivial compared to the big picture. So, and we need to see that big picture. Having said that, this is a common misconception. And that is that ibtila means what is it tila by the way test everyone says a test great it's a test so it's some problem that occurs it's a predicament a dilemma a catastrophe right ibtila test that's the common conception but we need to understand it again more fully ibtila is not only in adversity, it's also in prosperity. Oops, we might have to change the title of the talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Noble Quran, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ وَإِلَيْنَا تُرْجَعُونَ And we test you with adversity and prosperity. Fitna, it is a fitna, it's a test or a tribulation. And you will be returned to us. So sharr and khayr, prosperity and adversity, both can be ibtila. So just like we ask trial or punishment, ibtila or punishment, we should ask, is it a trial or a reward? But we don't ask, because if we figure, if it's prosperity, alhamdulillah, I don't care. Ibtila or reward, be it what it may. But if it is adversity, oh then, is this a trial? Is Allah testing me? Or is Allah punishing me? Did I do something wrong? But when it's the other way around, it's not the same. Again, the weakness of the human being. He doesn't think about, is it a trial or is it a reward? When it's prosperity, alhamdulillah. But that might, may be an even more difficult test. What's the, how, what's the criteria? How do I know if this is a test or this is really a reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you are enjoying all of the blessings of Allah and His prosperity, and you see that you are gradually moving away from Allah azza wa jal and His commandments, beware, beware. If you see that that prosperity 
is distancing you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it may very well be that adversity is better for you than the prosperity you're experiencing. Be careful. Takes self-evaluation. Looking at oneself critically, looking at one's life, looking at one's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like you evaluate all of your other relationships, your relationship with your wife, relationship with your husband, relationship with your parents, with your children. When is the last time we evaluated our relationship with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala? So I assume you're waiting for the answer. How do I know if it's trial or punishment? A whole lecture just to answer one question. I was thinking to myself, should I give the answer first? Or should I not only give an introduction, but mention something even more important? And I decided I'm going to delay the answer a little bit. Because the first answer is, does it really matter? Yes, brothers and sisters, tell me. Does it really matter if it's a reward or a punishment? If it's a trial, ibtila, or is a punishment for, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are we asking this question and why are we so concerned? I want an answer from you. Because my first impression is, it shouldn't really matter. If you think otherwise, please tell me, it's an open forum. Why does it matter? Nobody wants to say? Then uh, we're done. If it doesn't matter, we go home. No Q&A, no need. Problem solved, <laughs> right? So tell me why it matters. Why do you want to know? Why are you here? People are like, why is the Sheikh asking this? I want to know. Why do you want to know? Look deep inside yourself. Why do you want to know? If it's a reward or a punishment. What's going to result from that? Wise people ask questions that will lead to some kind of action, right? And you are all wise. So why do you want to know? And why doesn't anyone want to tell me? Now that's the second question. Does nobody know or they're shy? Or they know but they don't want to say? Share your knowledge. Yes, brother. Expectations. Sorry? Expectations. Meaning? Whatever we do reflects on others? I don't follow. We're more towards dunya, okay. And therefore, we want to know if it's a test or a punishment. What, what, what will result if I know? So if I know it's a test, what will happen? If I know it's punishment, what will happen? That's one way to think about it. Yes, brother. Uh, <coughs> learning of this, we want to reshape our life. Uh -huh. Our action, we have to redefine what we have been doing. Is it the correct or not? So learning of this thing, uh -huh. uh, we can evaluate and we can define our course of action for success. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, you're saying uh, okay, how, how, is act, how will action be different if you discover it's a trial as opposed to it's a punishment? How, because you said it will lead to a different action. So how will the action be different? Okay, you learn that, you know, the, the, the accident you got into, the child you lost, God forbid, the parent um, uh, kicked out of university, whatever adversity you are experiencing, you learn that it was a test from Allah. What action would that lead to? Because I have to have the patience 
can form conviction. Okay, great. We have to be patient, right? Pai. So do you mean to say if it is one and not the other, I will be patient. If it's the other, I will be impatient. No, I have to be patient in all the circumstances. Okay. So because someone might say, if it is this, I can be patient. If it is that, <laughs> and <laughs> you're not gonna be patient? So you're gonna rip your clothes? You're gonna uh, throw yourself from the building? Yes, brother. Okay. Um, Salam. Well, I would say it shouldn't really affect your actions. However, whether, if, if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you as a form of punishment, then you should fill you with fear. However, if you know it, that it should you fill you with fear. fear. Okay. And if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, 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 is bringing upon you a trial, mm. then it should, it should fill you with hope. So the mindset will change, however the action should not change. Okay, Barakallah Fiq, I think that's an excellent answer. So, whether it's one or the other, there will be some slightly different repercussion. Maybe not necessarily in the action, right? The action technically should be the same, which is patience in all situations, whether it is a trial or a punishment. But at the same time, the brother mentioned hope and fear. So, if it's a punishment from Allah, I should be afraid, right? Because if it's a punishment, it means I need to rectify something, right? And if it's ibtila, I don't need to rectify anything, or do I? Still have to rectify. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. Whether we are living our life actually be aware because sometimes we may misuse the resources in prosperity if we don't uh, only not for hope we <coughs> have the fear also in our mind mm. so that we don't misuse the resources the blessings of Allah mm. and we have the responsibility not only on us mm. we have the responsibility <coughs> towards others also okay. that, uh, I am doing that uh, that also I have to consider Barakallah uh, if we say that <coughs> If I realize that it's a punishment, that punishment is probably because of something wrong I'm doing, because of a sin. The brother said fear. It fills me with fear. What should result from that fear? Some kind of action. Repentance, rectification, more self-evaluation. So. But then I say, okay, wait a second. Assume it's a punishment. Is it trial or, tri or, or punishment? Assume it's a punishment. What will that do? In all cases, you will be filled with fear. You will be enticed to look into your relationship with Allah, to evaluate, to rectify, to repent. And that should be the case all the time. Right? Actually, one of the reasons we ask this question, unfortunately, it evinces a, a clear perception amongst Muslims that they are doing well with Allah Azza wa Jal. So in other words, and I believe that was part of the, the slogan on the, on the flyer, I pray, I do good things, I'm obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I stay away from His prohibitions, but, but what? So, it evinces a perception amongst Muslims that they have reached some kind of perfection in their lives, in their religious lives, in their religiosity. It evinces a type of haughtiness in thought. It evinces a type of ignorance about the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The great generations of Muslims were nothing like this. They were the opposite. They were always looking down upon themselves. 
They are always evaluating themselves and finding themselves to be so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They practice such a level of self-deprecation. I think it might be difficult for us in this age and this atmosphere to do, but we try our best. When some of the Sahaba say something like, without exaggeration, say something like, if Allah accepts one sajda from me, I'm happy. Allahu Akbar. One sajda, then I'm satisfied. So they're doubting every salah, they're doubting every sajda. And you and I are saying, why is Allah doing this to me? I'm perfectly fine, I'm doing well, I do my prayers, I do this and that. Right? This is part of the problem. Our thinking, our perception. If we understood the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what Allah deserves of us, what the price is for the blessings that we enjoy every day, we wouldn't even ask this question. We immediately pre-assume, I'm far away from Allah. So whatever happens to me, it's okay. And maybe it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should punish me more. This is little compared to what I deserve. Look at the, it's a diametrical opposite thinking. That question would never come up for a person with that type of thinking. So this is one of the first problems. Why are we thinking this in the first place? Because we do tend to look up to our status or our actions, our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are so far away. How many of the rights of Allah have we fulfilled? How many of the rights of the Prophet sallallahu The rights of people around us, our parents, our children, our spouses. So many rights to fulfill. A Muslim always humbles themselves doesn't think of themselves highly. Once you start think of you, thinking of yourself highly, that could, God forbid, lead to arrogance. And arrogance, you know where arrogance leads and where it led Satan. But we live in a world where the zeitgeist is pat yourself on the back, right? Pat yourself on the back. Think about the eye. People are, so it seems we got to the, the extreme. We became, mashallah, so altruistic. And now we need to start thinking about the eye again. I, think about I, self-confidence. I'm not against self-development, that's very important. But again, the way we look at it, the perception, the ideology, the conception, Pat yourself on the back, you're doing well, you're doing great, you're amazing, you're perfect. Hold on, wait. <laughs> Hold on. There needs to be a middle path. Nobody is saying, whip yourself in criticism, but at the same time, don't put yourself on a pedestal you do not deserve. So, is there a value to knowing? There may be. Because we are weak, unfortunately. Because we may find it difficult to always perceive it as a punishment. And because we may find it difficult to always feel we have to do more and we have to improve. And I think sometimes it is wise to be realistic and to understand, you know, the, the, how far we are from the time of the Prophet ﷺ the general atmosphere where people are, sometimes we need to come to the ground. Sometimes when we read the stories of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, we think, uh, wait a second, this is not on Earth. This is on planet X, right? But guess what? It was planet Earth, because until now, they haven't discovered another planet that can uh, have viable life. They're still looking. Hawking was looking, he died, and he didn't find anything. And that is a a deep regret because we were hoping that he would find Islam before uh, he met his maker. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, there can be a difference. Maybe for us specifically, it's not that easy to always 
perceive it as a punishment and therefore we like to know. And we are weak. May Allah forgive us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mind you, with regards to patience, it doesn't make a difference. Makes a difference in the other aspect. Patience? No. Can you decide, I'll be patient if it's ibtila, I won't be patient if it's iqab? Or the other way around? No. Patience is a must in all cases. You have to be patient. Sometimes whether you like it or not, this is what happened. You, you can't do anything about it. So be patient and try to be content as well. You don't have a choice. Whether it is punishment or whether it is just a trial. You must be patient. And this is the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam when he said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Amazing is the affair of the believer. All of his affair or affairs are good. And this is something that happens solely to the Muslim and applies only to the Muslim. If he experiences prosperity, he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is good for him. And if he experiences adversity, he is patient. Notice he didn't tell us, Oh Rasulullah, is the adversity trial or punishment? Doesn't matter. If he experiences adversity, whatever, whatever it is, he is patient. And it will be good for him. So patience is required. And sometimes you have no other option because you can't change it whether it is a trial or a punishment. <coughs> <coughs> so this first point is to emphasize that this uncertainty is actually quite beneficial. Not knowing if it's a trial or a punishment. This is one of the few instances where certainty is not necessarily praiseworthy. Uncertainty is okay. Maybe to a certain level, depending on your personality. There are personalities, you know, they like everything clearly defined. Fine, that's in your own life. <laughs> but you cannot ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, please designate for me if this is a trial or a punishment. All right? But the personalities, some personalities, they need to know. Others, they can accept some uncertainty. I am claiming that in this situation, that uncertainty is beneficial. Because certainty will necessarily lead to complacency. If you become certain about what it is, and maybe you become certain that it is ibtila. Oh, alhamdulillah. So it's not because I'm doing anything wrong. Okay, and it means I am perfect, maybe not perfect, just less than perfect. I need to change nothing. I can continue the way I am. Complacency. Uncertainty will lead to otherwise. You're constantly thinking, is it this? Did I do wrong here? Was I, should I have done that differently? I, should have, I shouldn't have spoken to him or her that way. When I did whatever I did yesterday, that wasn't the right way to do it. I should have remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You keep evaluating. You keep looking critically. If you have certainty, you won't. So this uncertainty is actually very useful. I remember subhanallah, until now, that I got this question when I was in the States from a non-Muslim. Because they want to have certainty. And essentially the way a lot of Christians hear about their religion from their teachers, priests, pastors, whatever. It's all about certainty. You believe in Jesus, you're saved. Period. Full certainty. So his question to me was, how are you sure you're on the right path? He wants some kind of a magical potion. Yes, you're doing everything properly. Perfect, continue the way you are. He wants, that, he wants to see that certainty. I said, uh, is that certainty really required? 
Why is that required? Actually, uncertainty will be more of an incentive to act than otherwise. A simple example. A surah you recite every day, at least 17 times. What do you ask Allah Azza wa Jal? Al-Mustaqim. Aren't you on Sirat Al-Mustaqim? You're praying 70 rak'ahs a day. You're doing all your furud. And you're saying, Aren't you on already Sirat Al-Mustaqim? You're not? No, we hope we are, right? But that margin of uncertainty. That is that incentivizes us to work, to do more. Not knowing, am I doing it properly? I need to do better. I need to improve as opposed to certainty. Did the Sahaba have certainty? Yes. Many of them got glad tidings of paradise. Allahu Akbar, done. Go to sleep. Abu Bakr, go to sleep. Umar, go to sleep. Uthman, go to sleep. Ali, radiallahu anhu ajma'in, go to sleep. Khalas, you got paradise. If it was me or you, right? Ahmad or Zulkifli or Noor, I don't know what. You have a lot of Noors. MashaAllah, you are all Noor. Go to sleep. If you got now a piece of paper, Alhamdulillah, you are of the people of... Khalas, Alhamdulillah. Sit on in Dr. Cafe until the Day of Judgment. <laughs> Do nothing. That's the way you and me are. That's not the way the Sahaba were. He got that certainty. He put it aside as if it was nothing. Not disrespecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the level of self-criticism and self-deprecation. I need to do more. And then they die on their deathbeds and they still say, I don't know if I am going to the pleasure of Allah or God forbid I am going to the wrath of Allah. But he got already the guarantee. Humility with regards to the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This uncertainty that we are talking about but again human nature we know that after the Prophet وسلم, was persecuted and after he went to at Ta'if and he was abused and pelted with stones alayhi afdal salatu was salam he sat down and he was complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwwati wa qilla hilati, qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas. And this narration, some scholars of hadith say it is weak. But at the same time, a lot of the scholars, some scholars of hadith and other general Islamic scholars, they uh, deduce things from this dua. <clears throat> so the Prophet ﷺ, after he complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Oh Allah, I complain to you of my weakness and strength, and my inability to do anything. This is after he was persecuted. Later on he says, إِلَّمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ عَلَيَّ غَضَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي Subhanallah. So he says, If you are not angry with me, I am not concerned. But your afia, and afia is a very comprehensive word that gives you the, the meaning of comfort and safety and security in all facets of life. He says this is more comforting for me. In other words, O oh Allah, if you are not angry with me, I am not concerned. But because that seems to indicate that he is saying, I don't care if you test me, as long as you're not angry with me. But then even that he says, but... Al-Afiyah is better for me. Al-Afiyah from what? From Ibtila. 
So even then, not being tested in this way is better. And we are human beings. And the Prophet ﷺ is a human being. But this is to answer that question. Does it matter if it's a trial or punishment? The Prophet ﷺ wants to know. If you're not angry with me, you're testing me, fine. I'm okay with that. Right? But if you're angry with me, then the situation might be a little, dif a little bit different. So that answers the question of does it matter? It's, it's a human feeling, subhanAllah. It's a human emotion. Wanting to know, is Allah angry with me? Is Allah pleased with me? So, again, as usual, I hope I'm not confusing you. There's a middle path of wanting to know, of hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us and not angry with us. But at the same time, you're not going to get that absolute certainty. There will remain a margin of uncertainty which inshallah, if you look at it and understand it properly, will only be an incentive to do more, not to do less. So, things that happen in this world, adversity that occurs, is it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it due to our actions? The floor is yours. Our actions, due to our actions, sometimes. sometimes. Any anybody else? If it is due to our actions, does that mean that it's not decreed by Allah? <laughs> Any other replies? Is it the taqdeer of Allah or is it our actions, or both? Both. both? Or none of the above. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Noble Quran that everything is by decree. Allah Azza wa Jal decrees what He wills. Actually, everything that happens in this world, if it happens, is decreed by Allah, period. What is the cause of that? If we talk about it as a causal relationship, Yes, you did something and therefore Allah decreed it for you knowing you were going to do what you were going to do. Is that clear? So when Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, He tells us in more than one ayah, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَحْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not decree any adversity, any predicament except by what your own hands have earned. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Subhanahu wa ta'ala ma akramu wa arham The most merciful forgives much. So even though you are seeing problems, predicaments, dilemmas, catastrophes, as a result of people's actions and what their hands have earned, despite that, Allah is forgiving much. If it was tit for tat, if it was going to be punishment equivalent to what sins we have committed, guess what? There wouldn't be a planet Earth. There wouldn't be life. Because he says in the other ayah, وَلَوْ يُؤَخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِظُلْمِهِمْ مَا تَرَكَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ Allahu Akbar If Allah Azza wa Jal were going to hold us accountable exactly for our actions giving each action what it deserves guess what? There would be no one left in this life 
So he's forgiving much, but there is a percentage, a small percentage of punishment or adversity, which is a result of what our own hands have earned. So when we look at the situation of the world, and God knows when you look everywhere, you see the, the, the extent of suffering in all different facets of human living. You realize that this is a result of the corruption of the human being. So all of what you're seeing of moral corruption and depravity and suffering in the world, this is a result of people's actions. So we know that yes, and this is where punishment comes in, due to a person's actions. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He tests. He tests whom He wills. He will continue to test. He tests His slave servants. For good reasons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He is going to test us. He said, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشْرِ الصَّابِرِينَ He's going to test us with death. He's going to test us with, with lack of wealth, with hunger, with fear, with all sorts of different predicaments to see if we are going to be patient. To raise our status in order to differentiate and distinguish between those who are good and those who are evil. Between do, those who accept Allah's decree and those who will object. Between those who are content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree and with those who will do otherwise. And the wisdom behind ibtila. Uh, we can talk about ibtila all we want, but here I'm not talking about the concept of ibtila per se, but rather the question of is it an ibtila or is it a punishment? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the epitome of contentedness whenever he was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so were the rest of the Prophets, peace be upon them all. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually tests those who He loves. So if you, are, you find that you are being tested, and God willing it is a test, and inshallah for many of you it will be a test, we hope, rather than a punishment, then know that God willing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. And this may be another answer for why we want to know if it is a test or a punishment. Because if it's a test, it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. If it is a test, if we can ascertain that it is really ibtila. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test those he loves. And the stronger a person is in religiosity, the harder they will be tested. The further you get in the university of Iman, the harder the test will become. I mean, it's, it's only logical, right? You can't be taking undergraduate tests when you're at the, the stage of the PhD. Simple enough. If we look at it really as a test, that's what the test is. When you get stronger, the tests will become more difficult. May Allah make us firm, insha'Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said in the uh, hadith, that if that is the case, when you are being tested, if someone is content, then great, they are going to be content. If they are going to object or be displeased, let them be displeased. Allah will be displeased with them. Contentedness with that which you are being tested will bring about the pleasure of Allah. Discontent and objection will bring about the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah tests who it pleases. You do what you want. 
You, you react to the test the way that you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test those whom He loves. The more He loves them and the stronger they are and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more they will be tested. And because they're closer to Allah, they will be patient, God willing, towards what they are being tested with. So therefore, when you see that if you look at your own life and you see I'm being tested in so many things one misfortune after another one catastrophe after another and you look to your life and you feel that it is ibtila and not a punishment because for all practical purposes you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least to the best of your ability it may be the tests of Allah and then you look on the other side and you see, subhanallah, this person is not worshipping Allah. This person does not believe in Allah. This person doesn't do his prayers. This person, this, that, this, that, one after another. But they're living the good life. This is a natural emotion and a natural reaction. And in fact, this was even uh, mentioned to Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah himself, some <coughs> seven centuries ago. So a man came to Ibn al-Qayyim and he said, if I become religious and I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to suffer misfortune and ibtila and so on and so forth. <coughs> and if I do not, then I will be happy in life and Allah will give me and this and that. Even then, so Ibn al-Qayyim immediately responded to him and he said, if he's doing that to you, he is testing you to see if you will accept the test or not. And if you do otherwise, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be displeased with you. So this type of thinking existed and it is one of the pitfalls <coughs> as we will see. <coughs> Excuse me. If you see the, those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoying those pleasures, do not fret, my brothers and sisters. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, if you notice that Allah is providing the goods of this world to a person despite the fact that he is sinful, then this is inciting him to commit sins until Allah takes that person, takes him away to him while he is in a state of committing sins. Then the Prophet ﷺ recited, so when they forgot the warning with which they had been reminded, we opened to them the gates of every pleasant thing. Allah opened the gates of prosperity to them. Until in the midst of their enjoyment, in that which they were given, all of a sudden we, we took them to punishment and lo, they were plunged into destruction with deep regrets and sorrows. So don't fret. When you see that, don't think that therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Allah is giving them. Let them have whatever they want to have. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا Don't worry about that. If you see the disbelievers enjoying every kind of blessing. And by the way, it is only apparently. They seem to be enjoying themselves. And then one after another, you see them taking their own lives. Committing suicide. Some of those people you thought were the happiest people in the world ended up taking their own life. The famous, I forgot his name, the famous singer of Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, you, you heard of that song, right? Don't Worry, Be Happy. Everyone knows it. He committed suicide. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Contradiction, what's going on? Right? It's all apparent. Don't be deceived by what you see. Apparently, the reality is otherwise. But, let it be. Nonetheless, if they are enjoying themselves and they are really happy or they think they are happy, let them be. This is not proof of Allah's pleasure 
it is very possibly the opposite. Allah is keeping them. Because in many cases, and Allah Azza wa is the most wise, and He knows what incites people into action, what motivates people. For a lot of us, prosperity is a recipe for disaster, is it not? Complete prosperity. What brings us back? Adversity. In prosperity, you sit back drinking your coffee. Happy, enjoying your life, everything's okay. You ask, brother, how are things? Alhamdulillah, everything is great. You then you ask him about his worship, his salah, you find maybe it's very modest. But then when you see him in a time of adversity, mashallah, you see him in Qiyamul Layl, you see him in the masjid, you see him with dhikr, because he wants something. So he's coming back to Allah Azza wa Jal. In many situations, Allah Azza wa tries us and casts adversity upon us in order to come back to Him, in order to come back and beseech Him. It's been a very long time you haven't implored Allah. It's a, it's a, it's a very long time you haven't stood before Him and cried to Him and complained to Him. So the adversity occurs and then you come back. And then you are humbled. Prosperity gives you a sort of strength in your body but a weakness in your soul. And the opposite is true once adversity hits. Once your body is weakened, it strengthens your soul, your proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're fasting, what is that weakest point you're at? Right before the iftar. And you're making dua, and you're starving, and you're famished, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty. Your body is, has been fatigued by the fasting, but your soul is most nourished, is it not? When you're making the dua at that time, don't you feel closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What happened? Physically, you were totally weakened. Spiritually, you feel revived, you feel closer. It's much easier to tear because of that weakness. That's when you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly with adversity, that's what it does. When we choose to treat adversity and respond to it in the right way as we mentioned. So don't worry when you see that the disbelievers uh, are, enjo are enjoying themselves in this way. Back to the answer. I don't know, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I have the answer. Is that enough or should we? Is it clear what the answer is or not yet? Have I answered indirectly? Is it a trial or is it a punishment? Let's put it this way. Having said all of that, if the misfortune, if the adversity that occurs happens and is clearly a result of some sin that you did, then know very well that it is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you partook in some unequivocally haram financial transaction. And afterwards, locusts destroyed your wealth. <laughs> Termites ate all of your money. Guess what? It's a punishment. It's not a tila. Clearly. Because then the punishment is of the same type of the sin that you are committing. Similarly, God forbid, if it was some STD as a result of fornication and going beyond the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And other examples. When that catastrophe is of the same type and related to the sin that you committed then it is clearly a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is not ibtila on the other hand if that ibtila 
that test, that predicament or adversity happened at a time when you were never closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you just performed some action that was in complete obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you just left something for the sake of none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You saw the haram that was going on in your company and you said, I'm not going to do it. And you lost your job. Ibtila. Know it with certainty for the same reason. Because you were doing something out of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was a clear haram. You abandoned that which is prohibited for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Necessarily, that adversity that touched you was a test from Allah azza wa jalla. It wasn't a punishment. Is that part clear? Okay. What if the adversity is not a result of committing a sin or some obedience? You're living your life normally. And something happens. You lost a loved one. You, your uh, marriage fell apart. You had, you lost uh, big in some transaction, in some investment. You had an accident. Whatever happens. The usual predicaments and adversity that people experience in their lives. In that situation, is it a test or is it a punishment? Okay, again. Let's take the, the, the black and white situation and then we'll come to the gray. The black and white situation is if you are the type of person who is far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are a sinner. You're not keeping to your prayers. You're not dutiful towards your parents, dutiful towards the people around you, whatever it may be. There's a good possibility that this is a punishment. But, if you are for all practical purposes, again, we said always the priority is self-deprecation. Don't raise yourself to a pedestal. But for all practical purposes, Alhamdulillah, you do what is obligatory, you, do, you, you perform your prayers, you stay away from his prohibitions, and so on and so forth. So there's a good possibility that whatever adversity occurred is ibtila. That it is not a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What if, what if, again, you're just, you're a normal person, just like you and me, doing the best that we can. We have sins, may Allah forgive us. May Allah azza wa jal raise our status, inshaAllah. And then the adversity occurred. Will you know for sure? Not necessarily. And we mentioned before that that uncertainty is okay. Make it an incentive. Alright? Sometimes, subhanallah, some misfortunes, and these are regarding misfortunes that you clearly do not have a role in contributing to. In other words, a death of a loved one. You didn't contribute to that, right? Unless you did. In some way. You had a car accident. Allahu Akbar. Why did this happen to me? What did I do? I'll tell you what you did, brother. You were driving 170 kilometers per hour. That's why. Another one of the pitfalls, as we will see. You had a role in contributing to the adversity. I'll get to that, inshallah. But that's why I say, in general, if that adversity or catastrophe you clearly have not contributed to in any way, then, and you are just a regular person, you're practicing for all practical purposes, but you do have your sins, well, it may be this and it may be that. And you need not spend all your time trying to understand if it is indeed a trial or a punishment. And you can assume it is a punishment, for some of the 
uh, sins that you may be doing, as long as that incentivizes you to do more. If, and this is a big if, if that feeling of, no, it is a punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becomes an obstacle and a hindrance to you from improving and rectifying, that's when it behooves you to truly ascertain if it is a trial or a punishment. Did I lose you? In other words, thinking that way too much, beyond my capacity, always thinking this is a punishment from Allah, if it starts to become a hindrance to me, I feel that it is a punishment from Allah, so I stop doing more, I stop rectifying, I stop improving. Ah, oh, Allah is going to punish me? Okay, what to do? This is dangerous. That's when you need to come back and self-evaluate more. And really try to ascertain if it is something that is a trial or a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, subhanallah, uh, and I say this last because, again, it is one of the pitfalls where people are looking for signs. The only way to know if it is ibtila or a punishment is a sign from Allah. If I see a sign, I'll know. If it's a, a punishment or an ibtila. Guess what, brothers and sisters, you're not always going to see signs. Stop looking for the signs. Ah, oh, look, there, there's the sign, that's it. No, you're not always going to see a sign. That's not how life works. But sometimes you might. And that will help you to understand if it is a trial or a punishment. If you are like Imran ibn Hussein, the famous Sahabi, then you will see a sign. So Imran ibn Hussein was afflicted. He was afflicted with a disease in his uh, stomach or in his bowels, which as narrations say, incapacitated him on the bed for 30 years. 30 years he didn't even get up in order to respond to the call of nature he did it there they, they bore a hole in that part of his bed 30 years and he is content and he figured it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even when some of the tabi'een would come and visit him. They would cry and cry. He says, why are you crying? Because they're saying, because of the situation you're in. Don't you see the situation you're in? And he was patient and patient and patient. And in one of the narrations, actually according to the authentic narration, he tells them part of what gave him patience. And what indicated to him that it is a test. He told them, the angels come and they say, they say salam to me constantly. <laughs> it's a sign. In the other narration he said, so that was how I knew that it is a trial and not a punishment. So I am patient. Will the malaika come and say salam to you? Not likely. Not likely. Will you see some sign? Maybe. Don't spend too much time looking for it. And don't make signs out of things that do not exist. We do that too much, trying to explain every single thing. But maybe you see something which gives you patience. And helps you ascertain that it is ibtila and not a uh, punishment. Ultimately, Whenever you have and you experience that adversity, always go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beseech Allah azza wa jal. In your dua, in your worship. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you patience. Ask, ask Allah azza wa jal to give you strength. 
say the famous dua of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah ma'jurni fi musibati wa akhlif li khayran minha. Okay, oh Allah, reward me in this musibah, in this predicament, in this adversity, and grant me something better than it. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Noble Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَن يَتَوَكَّ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ That whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jalla will make a way out for him. He will make a way out for you. It may not be immediate. You may have to wait. But that is, there's a condition. And this is the toughest part. So, Actually, instead of asking for the way out, fulfill the condition and you'll find the, the, the escape. The escape is if you fulfill the condition. So should you ask for the escape or the condition? Ask for the condition. What's the condition? Taqwa. If we reach that level, then Allah Azza wa will make a way out for you. And He will grant you from where you least expect it of his bounty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way out. This is the way to deal with it. No matter what. Maybe a person says, wait a second, a lot of this adversity you're talking about is adversity in the dunya. Oh, that's a very good question. What about adversity in the deen? Oh, sallallahu salama. Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Right? That's a different issue. <coughs> if it's adversity in the deen, this is the worst. Adversity in the dunya. Who hasn't experienced adversity in the dunya? Musiba fi deen. Tilka al musiba. Musiba til masaib. That's the real issue. That's why it is said that Umar ibn al Khattab, عنه, whenever afflicted with any adversity, one of the things he would praise Allah about in that adversity is that Alhamdulillah it is not in my deen it's not in my heart you find a person who is drowning in adversity many of the stories of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een but his tongue does not stop in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is a greater blessing than that Apart from the fact that whatever adversity that person is experiencing is all raising his status. Mountains of hasanat due to adversity. To the extent that the Prophet ﷺ said that people would, when they see the extent of reward for those who suffered adversity on the day of judgment, they would hope or they would wish that they were afflicted with the same adversities. Seeing the mountains of reward Allah Azza wa Jal has for them. So whenever, God forbid, if it is in the deen, this is where a person really needs to keep evaluating. Maybe I'm not as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before, I'm not as dutiful in my prayers and my worship. That's understandable. Iman goes up and down. We know that. It's a sinusoidal wave. We hope it's not, but it's a wave. Okay. So it goes up and down. When it's up, Alhamdulillah, do everything you can to benefit in that period. When it's down, beware of, because understandably you won't be as dutiful in your worship in general as you are when Iman is up. But, at least stick to the fara'id. That, sh that is the bare minimum. The bare minimum. Don't go below that. God forbid. You used to pray sunnah, you're not praying sunnah now, you're going through whatever it is. Fine. But beware of missing your prayers. This is where you're getting into the dangerous zone. The fara'id, that which is an obligation. You should fulfill at all times. Let me mention just a few important uh, pitfalls and I will conclude. As we said before, we are always trying to find a metaphysical explanation. Please resist the temptation to do this. 
We always want to explain the actions of Allah and the decree of Allah. This happened because of this. This happened because of that. Guess what? This happened because you're an idiot. This happened because you lied. That happened because you treated so and so this way. That's why it happened. You got into the accident because you were speeding. You failed the test, my dear, because you started studying at 3 a.m. Oh, I failed the test. Qaddar Allah wa ma When did you start studying? Uh, yesterday. Okay. Stop blaming Allah. Blame yourself. Especially when the adversity, what you are calling adversity, you, are, you have clearly contributed to with your own idiocy or with your own lackluster attitude, with your own abandoning of your duties, neglect, whatever you want to call it. First look to yourself. Before anything, did you contribute to that problem? Imagine telling your boss, the project failed, you didn't reach the KPIs that you were supposed to reach. Boss, qaddar Allah wa ma sha'afan. Allahu Akbar. Then after a while you see the, the, the letter <laughs> on your desk. Huh? You got fired. Stop blaming Allah. Stop looking for a metaphysical explanation. Unless it is clearly not due to some neglect on your part that you didn't contribute in some way then you can start trying to understand it so this is one of the major pitfalls we're always trying to put things on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not looking at our own selves this is why I said this question sometimes is also due to that lack of introspection and self-deprecation that we talked about before so if the fault is clearly your own. That's it. You were the one who brought this about. It was decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your negligence. Alright? Another common pitfall is that if I follow the commands of Allah azza wa jal, then I will be tested. This is what you say. This is what the authentic hadith says. Then I will have Misfortune. Ostensibly, this will dissuade the disbelievers and those who are newly guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wait a second. If I start obeying Allah, then I will have misfortune. Oh, God forbid. I don't need that religion. I don't need to be religious. I don't need to fulfill the my duties towards my my lord god forbid again we go back that is because you misunderstood the concept of ibtila that is because your focus is only on the dunya that is because you didn't understand that that misfortune as little as it may be allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may raise your status to the highest levels. The Prophet ﷺ said, even if you are pricked by a thorn, you know, if you're walking outside and you hit your toe on that chair, subhanallah, you'll be rewarded for that. So, if you are rewarded for something so minor, imagine the rewards if you are patient with true misfortune that afflicts you. So this is why when the, the, the man came to Ibn al-Qayyim and he said, if I repent to him and I'm closer to him and I do good deeds and so on, then I will no longer have any provision and I, I won't enjoy my life. But if I sin against him and I gave my nafs everything that, I, that it wants, then he will help me and he will give me provision and so on and so forth. So Ibn al-Qayyim says, he says to him, this is a test for you. To see if you are going to be patient. And if you are truthful in your claim. In your claim that you are coming 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you are patient, then Allah will reward you. Otherwise, you are lying. And these trials, my brothers and sisters, are what distinguishes people. These tests, just like a, you know, the test you're taking at school. This is how you know the A's from the B's and the B's from the C's. And the C's from the D's and the F's. This is the only way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified it in the Noble Quran. When He said, Alif la meem. أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون. ألف لام ميم. Do the people think that they will not be tested or they will be left to say we have believed and that they will not be tested? Do you think you are just going to say I believe in Allah subhanahu wa taala? I am a true believer and then you will not be tested to see to test the nature of that belief. Is it real? Or is it artificial? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us patience, to always thank Him and be patient in adversity, to help us, it's okay as we said, to help us to distinguish between a test and a punishment, to assist us in humbling ourselves to His magnificence, and realizing how much he deserves from us, which will help us to be comfortable even in the uncertainty about whether it is a trial or a punishment, as a motivation to consistently rectify ourselves and improve our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abandon sins and be more being more dutiful in our worship of him insha'Allah Jazakumullah khayran wa baraka feekum Uh, so now we're going to open up the floor for any candidate. So any of you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I suggest you also give them a two minute break to stand up, stretch, flex your muscles, do whatever you want. And then we can ask it questions, inshallah, if there are questions. <sighs> Including myself. Allah. Uh, we do have some refreshments at the back for those who want to uh, have a cut from snacks. Salam, Sheikh Baha. Kaifa Halukum. Allah Yubarak. Sheikh, hello, Sheikh Sharif. Kaifa Halukum. Ayakallah. أنا ما أقدر تشوف التسجيل عفواً حتى أقدر تأخذون؟ for any sisters that would like to ask their questions, you can actually do so as well by writing your questions on a paper and then pass it to sister one by one on one. الله يا الله. Assalamualaikum. Okay, my question is, based on what you said just now, I really think that whether Allah gives us task or punishment, it is also based on pure intention or good or bad. 
So being there for the younger, youngster generation, um, there's too much bad influence of that. Plus you keep on being reminded at some point and you keep on getting away from him. So there's peer pressure and for some people they may think that it's uh, too young for them to repent. Okay, so this kind of behavior, I think that um, if it's too consistent then Allah might give us punishment somehow. So my question will be how we actually deepen our love to Allah uh, in the young, young hearts and what are the steps to get uh, you to closer to Allah and it's the comma to, to think that anything that would happen to you, you, you must be thankful and any calamity um, that happened, uh, you have to be patient. So you're asking how can you improve yourself in being patient whenever calamity hits? Is that yeah. what you're asking? And so how we do you do that for the younger generations? Yes. Um, understandably, for the younger generations, it'll be a little bit more difficult because their cognizance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at a different level compared to uh, the adults. But when you try to instill these values as early as possible in your children, this is most beneficial. Sometimes we underestimate uh, how our children can begin to know and understand and even love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that underestimation many times prevents you from instilling that at the proper age. So you start maybe very late and they're already a little bit older, they're already affected by certain ideas and so on and so forth. Start early, okay? So, uh, Luqman, uh, when he was telling his son, he told him very early on. He said, Ya Bunaya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. And he probably explained what inna shirka la dhulmun azim means. He said, don't associate partners with Allah. He's teaching him at a very early age, who is Allah? And what are his rights upon us? You can start at an early age, you can instill that in them, and you will definitely see that. Now, you will start to understand where they're at by their questions, the types of questions they're asking. I believe most of you have gotten questions from your children, maybe as early as four or five or six, about Allah, who is Allah, what is He like, what does He do, you start instilling that very early on. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that Allah azza wa jal loves those who do good, loves those who worship Him, who obeys Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abhors those who defy Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be good in the dunya because He wants to take us to paradise and al-akhirah. Even the, the idea of paradise and hellfire very early on. So, you start instilling that in the youngsters. Then, and obviously because in the dunya they are seeing certain things, calamities, accidents and so on. Again, be careful of this pitfall. Trying to teach them very, very early on that this is from Allah. That might be a little bit too early. The issue of the qadr. Why did the accident happen? Allah decreed it. Why did Allah decree it? This is more difficult. This is sometimes difficult even for adults to understand, much less the children. So, to your best extent, try not to attribute a lot of things that happen around us, especially when you are a clear contributing factor to it, to Allah Azza wa Jal. Why did the accident happen? I was driving too quickly, the guy swerved in, whatever it is. You can teach them, Qaddar Allah ma sha'a fa'al. This is a decree. This is decreed by Allah. Alhamdulillah, we are patient. Without going into too many details until you start understanding. When, prosper, when you are in prosperity, when good things are happening, you immediately attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, they begin to understand the issue of the taqdeer. But taqdeer with regards to calamities, and uh, suffering, many adults didn't get it right. So it can be a little bit difficult. The death of a, a loved one. Why did he die? My son, life and death are decreed. That's enough. Allah decrees this thing. Some people live, some people die. 
It's natural, right? I think this is, uh, this is a, a, a fine point that we should observe when we're try trying to talk about these issues with our children. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, Salaam. Uh, if I go back to your question, yes. whether it matters or not. Yes, thank you. Oh, why didn't you answer then? <laughs> it can be both. It can be both. Yes. All right. Right. Thinking, yes. That everything is just trials and tribulations and tests from Allah. Now, the second point is the punishment. Uh, if Allah gives punishment to the believers, yes. it is a process of, in this world, that is. Yes. It is a process of cleansing. Absolutely. Which is good. Absolutely. So, isn't that a subset of what we try for the test from Allah? To assert. To a certain extent, you can kind of look at it that way. If the reaction is correct. So, after saying everything we said, to answer the question whether it is a trial or punishment, you can actually take two avenues to answer that. By looking at the past and by looking at the future. And too many people look at the past. Oh, what did I do to deserve this? What happened so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing this to me? Sometimes that is correct. It is due to something that occurred, something you did. Therefore it is a punishment. Or it's just a test by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we said, Allah does what He pleases. Or the other possibility is that you become more forward looking. How are you going to react to what you've been afflicted with? And this is what the Qur'an actually directs to and focuses on. So after the ayah, for, let me just finish this point. After the ayah mentioning, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ And then he said, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to the patient. Who are they? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا عَلَيْهِ رَجَعُ إِنَّا وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَجَعُ أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Who are the ones who deserve the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His blessings? Those who reacted to the musibah, the predicament in the proper way. Those who were patient. So, knowing if it is ibtila or punishment, another way of ascertaining that is by seeing your response to it. If your response was patient and you said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, God willing, this is just a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you were patient. As you said, even if it was a punishment, that's why I said, whether it's this or this, can you be anything other than patient? So patience is a given, right? What might slightly change is the way I evaluate. Oh, if it's a punishment, I'm doing something wrong. I need to rectify it. If it's just a test, okay, maybe I don't need to look that hard for some sin that I'm committing. You see what I'm saying? But patience is a given in both. So you're going to be patient, even if Allah is punishing me. And when I am patient, it becomes a cleansing. It's a cleansing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything, every adversity or affliction, that's why I, I mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, even a thorn prick, something very minor, it's a cleansing and a purification from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On an individual level and on a collective level. Look at the ummah. Look at what's happening to your brothers and sisters in Syria, in Yemen, in Burma. On, on the level of the ummah, where they are, actually they are enduring catastrophes. And they are patient. This is a purification. Allah will raise their status. They will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take shuhada and so on. Yes, go ahead. If we understand the Quran, yes. it preaches love and positive thinking. Yes. Uh, however, uh, we are very much influenced by the acculturation of the cultures of different okay. countries. Okay. You are an Arab, right? Yes. You are an Arab. Alhamdulillah. We <laughs> are Malay. And sometimes yes. there is a saying yeah. that uh, how can I rephrase this? Yeah. That the 
Please tell me because then I can understand my Malaysian brothers and sisters more. <laughs> yeah, so tell me. Meaning? Oh, no, translate it for me now so we can discuss it. Okay. Is it is it a good culture? Both ways. Both ways. Okay. They are good and bad. Yes. Okay. But the sure. Thinking, you see, when you want the youth are able to, you want them to understand you. Yes. You must also understand the mindset, the acculturation process. Mm. Um, in our culture, keeps saying that if something befalls on you. Yes. A lot of sins, uh -huh. but it's only through the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. Right, it's right. It's a positive thinking process. Uh -huh. But the acculturation bit, how can you give a souvenir to all the youth here today yes. when they go back? Uh -huh. They will start thinking positive coming from, back from your uh, talk that everything that they're going to face from now on. That's why, that's what, it's a gift because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising your status. So when you start thinking, if I stub my toe, Allah will reward me because of something so minor, then imagine the rest of the misfortunes. This is all, this is, this is the positive thinking bit. <coughs> Having the patience, the, the, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we mentioned. If it is prosperity, thank Allah. If it is adversity, be patient. And it is all good for you. The Prophet ﷺ is telling you, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ كُلُّ أَمْرُهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ لِأَحَدِ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ So he's telling you, all of the affairs of the believer are good. Prosperity or adversity. How's, how's that for positive thinking? Right? Everything is good. If you understand it Islamically. Prosperity, we thank Allah. Adversity, we are patient. Allah rewards us. Allah purifies, purifies us of sins. Allah raises our status. If there is a punishment implicitly in that, which we might not know about, it only reinforces what should already be there and be practiced constantly, which is the introspection part looking deep inside ourselves crit critically <coughs> evaluating our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did I do something wrong this is also very important because you said acculturation we live in a world of pat yourself on the back you're doing great you're amazing you're mesmerizing you're gonna be in the you know the first one to enter paradise and so on and so forth sahaba were not like that there was always introspection there was self-deprecation but Self-deprecation that was motivational. That incited them to, to do more, not to do less. So this is where we need to keep looking at ourselves. If self-development requires that we understand ourselves better, understand yourself better, not only as a, as a personality, but as a human being with a relationship with the Creator. Yes, sister. Oh, okay. I, I cannot hear you. Assalamu yes, wa alaikum salam. Okay, I've been feeling by this idea for quite a long time ago, but is it true that uh, any kind of test or punishments that we receive during our lifetime would lessen the punishment in, the, in their after? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we talk about purification and cleansing, uh, that's why in the other authentic hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, he said that Allah will keep testing the human being, okay, to purify and cleanse them until he is walking on this earth sinless. Hastening the punishment in the dunya is so that you will not have the punishment of al-akhirah, which is a lot worse. He's giving you of the minor, quote-unquote, punishment in the dunya, so that you will not have it in al-akhirah. Yeah. Uh, okay to have what? As much as possible, 
That's why as much as possible, as long as you're patient, as long as it doesn't affect you. That's why one of the amazing Sahaba, when he had like a, a really bad fever and it was kind of constant, he said, Oh Allah, afflict me with what you please as long as I'm patient. So this is the idea. I'm fine with affliction as long as I can be patient with it. If it's beyond me, no, I cannot deal with that. That's why the, the, the Prophet said, I desire afia rather than testing. We don't ask Allah for testing and tribulation. We ask Allah for afia, right? We ask Allah for, we do ask Allah for prosperity. We don't want to be tested. We don't know if we'll be patient. But we say, oh Allah, if you test me, give me patience with that test. This is also a good question. She says, how do you practice contentment? And does pain nullify uh, contentment? For instance, remembering the trial and feeling pain when you remember it. And also what are permissible ways of expressing pain to Allah without complaining? Um, my dear brother, sister, complain to Allah. Complaining to Allah is not the complaining which is blameworthy. It's con consistently complaining to feeble human beings. So you're coming to me and you're, you're complaining and you want me to help you. For all practical purposes, it's like a drowning person trying to seek help from another drowning person. Seek help from Allah. Complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's who you should complain to. We don't complain enough to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't speak enough to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakaria alayhi salam was calling on Allah azza wa jal. He was talking to him. He was describing the situation. When he said, إِنِّي وَهَنَ الْعَظْمُ مِنِّي وَاشْتَعَلَ الرَّأْسُ شَيْبًا وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيَّةً وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَائِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي Allahu Akbar. Full story. He's telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the direness of his situation and why he wants someone to inherit him before he granted him Yahya as a miracle. Complain to Allah. We don't complain to Allah enough. Say it as it is. Talk to him. Describe the situation. Ask Allah to, to, to make a way out. So this is not wrong. Actually, the problem is we complain too much to people who don't want to listen to your problem. And you, that's why one of the poets said, SubhanAllah, you keep asking the human being and the human being gets more irritated and more annoyed the more you ask. And the person who gets angry with you, if you do not ask him, and this is Allah, you're not asking at all. Ask him. Seek him. Complain to him. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify uh, your situation. Feeling the pain is only natural, sister. Feeling the pain is only natural. And this does not nullify contentment, no. Actually, the more pain you feel, but deep down you are content, the better it is. That's why when uh, scholars were complaining the extent of contentedness of the Prophet ﷺ with others, they found that of the Prophet ﷺ better. So when someone said, if his uh, son or daughter died, he wouldn't cry. He's happy with the qadr of Allah. But the Prophet ﷺ cried when he lost his son. They said his riba, the riba, the contentedness of the Prophet ﷺ, is better and more praiseworthy than of that person who's saying, if my child dies, I won't cry. Why? Because that pain is only natural. And that pain is an expression of mercy and love. And this is praiseworthy. And the more contentedness you have, which exists simultaneously with the pain, the more that contentedness is worth. So no, there is no contradiction. But when it starts affecting that level of contentedness, when you start saying, why did that happen to me? Why did Allah take that loved one from me? Now we're, we've gone 
beyond the realm of pain and into the realm of objection to the qadr of Allah. You see what I'm saying? Ah, sorry, yeah, another one. That human will disobey, so my cousin even knows they will disobey because it makes me feel it is unfair. Hmm. Uh, this is a, a very basic uh, concept related to Qadr. So the sisters, uh, sister or brother, I don't know. Is saying uh, that if Allah created humans and He knows they will disobey, so why did He do so if He knows they will disobey? Simple answer, He also knows they will obey. So many will obey, right? Some will obey, some will disobey. He will reward those who obey and He will punish those who will disobey. Is it that difficult to understand? Yes, some will disobey and others will obey. Did he force you into disobedience? Yes or no? When you disobeyed Allah, did he force you? Did you feel a magical hand pushing you? Oh, oh, what's happening? Oh my God, I'm going to the place of disobedience. Did you feel something like that? No. You went willingly. You did it willingly. And this is, the, uh, this is the test of free will. It goes both ways. You have free will. You will do good. Some will do good. Some will obey. Some will disobey. Based on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward or punish. It's, it's not a matter of fairness or unfairness. We said Allah does what He wills. And it is in, in His entire wisdom. That's why when he told the malaika after well, telling them that he is going to create the khalifa and that he's going to make that khalifa on, on earth. So they are the ones who asked, Oh Allah, that Oh Allah, are you going to make this khalifa? And it, they are going to corrupt it. And they are going to shed blood and so on. So Allah says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. Allah knows all. I know what you do not know. Just as people are going to disobey, just as people are going to corrupt, just as people are going to shed blood, there are people who are going to worship. There are people who are going to love. There are people who are going to show compassion. There are people who are going to reform. There are people who are going to build. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to reward those. And He will punish the evildoers. Even though, when you look at the big picture, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will overwhelm even His anger. No, I just said, if you have pain because of the test, that's only natural. Losing a loved one, having, uh, enduring some catastrophe, it's only natural. The Prophet ﷺ himself is saying, Afiyah is better. Okay? Rather than ibtila, rather than a test. So, feeling that pain is only natural. What is the question? Uh, basically, if we feel pain, does that nullify contentedness? It's similar to the other question, or does that in any way mean that our iman is less? No. That pain is more than natural. The realm where you need to expend effort is being content with that. Not objecting to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The extent to which you are content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed. If you get to a very high level and very high status that we read about in these stories of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, they tell you things like, Adversity and prosperity are equal in my eyes. Maybe a very difficult uh, pedestal to reach. Where they're saying, whether it is prosperity or adversity, it is the same to me. It is the qadr of Allah and I'm happy. Okay? Ibn al-Qayyim, 
might have felt otherwise, that it is only natural to, to want adversity. And as in the, uh, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ that we mentioned, Anything else? Okay, one last question. Uh, imagine you are in the refugee camp in Syria or Palestine. Would you be giving the same advice to the people today? If you see the suffering there, and you choose to give punishment and a test. Did I say it is a punishment? I'm trying to give you the tools through which you can identify if it is a trial or if it is a punishment, number one. Number two, I said in the beginning, from a logical perspective, and I gave you also some of the ahadith, that whether we know or not is not that important. You see what I'm saying? Thirdly, sister, I'll, I'll allow you just a minute. Thirdly, uh, I'm giving a talk to a bunch of beautiful brothers and sisters in Dr. Cafe in the Strand in Pataling Jai, Damansara. Damansara, right? Malaysia. Necessarily, that will differ than a talk I will be giving to the refugees, let's say, in Syria or Lebanon or Bangladesh. You see what I'm saying? So, I, I kind of, I think I know what you're getting at, which is that, you know, uh, you, uh, you feel that the positive message is to say that everything is a test rather than a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is a totally dis different atmosphere. You cannot bring the two together. Go ahead. The government. The punishment is on the government, but without by the citizens. Okay. The other thing is probably you, your honorable person yourself, and myself, we are we are uh, very mature. So our way of thinking is probably different mm. than the younger I see. sisters. I see. So to them, uh, it's they are afraid that it might be punishment on them. And that's why when you mentioned earlier right. that perhaps if you say that it is a punishment, they, they will have sleepless nights. This is better for them to think that everything uh, is a trial. Okay, great. This is why I said if a person gets to the level, if you remember, gets to the level where engrossing themselves in the idea of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no longer becomes a motivator then you need to stop thinking that way. Remember when I said that? This is why I said moderation. For many of these Sahaba and the Tabi'een we mentioned, they can be thinking it's a punishment all the time because they, they, they understand the level of their negligence towards the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no problem seeing everything is a punishment. They probably think this is little. They got to a different level. But, if that idea that you are being punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no longer becomes a motivator to action and rather becomes a hindrance and a distraction, remember? Then you should not be thinking that way. And that's why I said in the first place, maybe you shouldn't even be asking the question. As I said in the very beginning, before I even talked about the tools, right? Why are we asking this question in the first place? Why do you want to know? Why is this certainty important? Uncertainty may be a better motivator. Right? And I, I can agree with you indeed that for some of the youngsters, that's the way they want to look at it. Especially as they are young, maybe they have, maybe they're not even uh, held accountable yet. They're not even held accountable. So there is no punishment anyway. It's just a test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, in many of these cases, it is a test from Allah. And if you look at it, in the forward-looking manner that I mentioned, If they are tested or tried, they are patient and they say, inna lillah wa inna rajiun. So you have, congratulations, you have made it a test because you passed it 
by being patient, by thanking Allah, by returning the issue to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by ultimately uh, doing what is required in such a situation whereby you, your status has been raised and you have been purified of sin, inshallah. Yes, sister. Hello? Okay. Uh, maybe these questions are not correlated with our current uh, discussion, which is uh, test and punishment. This is something like how, because I have this experience, I have a, a kid, three years old, that I've been explaining about the existence of God. Mashallah. And then he's been asking me, mm. what is God? Because I, this, is, this is a situation where I, where I bath him, that I say, he need to be clean, he need to, be, uh, he need to take care of his hygiene. And then he asked me why. I said, because Allah loves those people who are clean and hygiene. And then he asked me, where is Allah? Who is Allah? What is Allah? Then I keep explaining to him. And one day, he was playing around me, he was dancing around me, and I said, why are you playing around me? He said, because Allah is with me, he's following me, and Allah is making him busy. That's what he said. So I keep explaining to him, but uh, the logical thinking of three years old is very things that we are discussing are too abstract. Uh, for those uh, below five years old, they want things that logic, that what they uh, observe from their own eyes. And God is something we can't really provide for my own being. It's mm. difficult to uh, So Under- I mean, your, 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 <laughs> your uh, Understandably, and I think you, you answered yourself to a certain extent, which is always at this age, Attributing things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be problematic. So why should he be hygienic? Because if you're not clean, you're going to get, uh, you know, you're going to be uncomfortable. Or you're going to have a disease or you're going to suffer this and that. Uh, you know, instead of saying something like Allah loves it. And he doesn't even quite understand what or who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. For these issues, it's very easy to give them the, 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 the simple answer. Okay, instead of always saying, this is what Allah wants, this is what Allah loves. Why, are, why should I be truthful? Allah loves it. Who is Allah? Okay, uh, you should be truthful because it is good manners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves good manners. You can do that. Now, trying to rectify his idea of what Allah is, this is where you need to explain to them, yes, they are used to things which are tangible. Not only children, but adults are saying, there is no Allah because I can't touch it and I can't see it and I can't hear it. Much less the, the, the children. And this is the, the curse of positivism that we have in our world today. But ultimately, you can explain, Allah is not like His creatures. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Allah is beyond this. Again, I, I, I totally understand what he's saying, alright? But you have to correct it. He's not your friend. He's not, an, he's not your friend. Another is not an imaginary friend. He's not following you. He's not like us. He's beyond us. But he's the creator of everything. Okay? At one point, my little daughter thought paradise was a place, maybe in the Mansara, that we were going to go to. Okay? Honestly, when are we going to Jannah? You know, oh, it's a, it's a half an hour drive. <laughs> okay? This is, this is the way kids are. Okay, it's, it's understandable. So, uh, maybe, maybe he's too young at this point to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, but you can, you can correct those misconceptions that he has. He still has them, don't worry, in a year or two, he'll start to uh, understand it more. He'll start to understand it more and things will become clearer to him. But when there are things which you can explain simply, all right? As a matter of fact, that have to do with the dunya, just do it that way. Yes? We are, uh, we are finally come to an end for our discussion. Uh, we hope that everyone has benefited from this uh, talk, inshallah. Uh, just a couple of announcements before uh, we adjourn this discussion, inshallah. Uh, we will be having a two days intensive course which is called the Mothers of Nations. It's about the lives and, and the background of uh, the wives of the Prophet It's going to be on the 21st and 22nd of April, 2018. Uh, Inshallah, we'll be doing it in the KDU Blackberry, and it's going to be conducted by Sheikh Muhammad West from South Africa. So uh, the price.